So, welcome. We're talking about comparing Wingate and Chocolatey today. Um, hopefully a real world look at package management tools on Windows. Before we start, a huge thank you to all of our sponsors. So there's three parts to everybody being here today. It's speakers, it's yourselves, and it's also the sponsors. Without one of those parts, this doesn't work. So a big thank you to them. Please go and visit their booths. If they don't sponsor this, this doesn't happen. So just say hi, get some swag, that's what I do. And uh, yeah, just thank them for being here. So before we start, my name is Paul Broadwith. I'm a technical engineer and manager at Chocolatey Software. Um, me and my team are responsible for Chocolatey CLI that we're going to be looking at today and other Chocolatey products. Uh, so that's basically me, full disclosure. Um, I'm from Glasgow in Scotland, so a long way away. And um, we've got 33 years in IT and just huge different sectors, about half of that as a, a contractor as well. I'm also a Microsoft MVP, primarily for my work in PowerShell as well. So before I start, this is my personal opinion. Nobody at Chocolate Software has said, Paul, say this, don't say that. None of that has happened. The Chocolate team has seen the talk. This was last year. I got some feedback about it, and I've given this talk twice so far. Um, at PowerShell Conference Europe last year, and also Packaging Con in Berlin late last year as well. So this is the third time, possibly the last time I give this talk. Uh, so it's kind of tried and tested so far, had feedback, tweaked it since then. Um, this is research and findings based. I obviously know Chocolate CLI quite well, uh, being responsible for it, me and my team. Uh, but as far as Winget's concerned, I used Winget, or I still use Winget. Um, and I've looked into the various aspects we're going to talk about. So it's to do with documentation, forum posts, GitHub issues, all these different types of things. So this is research and findings based. If any of it is incorrect, people please let me know. Because um, this isn't supposed to be a hit piece against Winget. Um, this is supposed to be trying to basically look at both tools and, and coming up with some sort of conclusion for everybody, some sort of fact-based information. There are no scores, so we're not going to do a, as you've maybe seen in the media, they do a point for this and a point for that, and they talk them up at the end and all them magically this product wins that they've been paid to write about. This isn't how I'm doing it today. This is just talking about information and facts. There's no scores. Uh, this slide here reminds me to tell everybody that I know not everybody's first language is English. Being from Scotland, I talk very fast. We've also got a lot of information to go through today. So if I talk too fast or I'm not uh, clear about something, please let me know. Give me the old slow down, Team America secret signal, and I'll slow down or repeat myself for that, okay? <clears throat> but the other part of it is because we've got a lot to get through, Let's do some questions at the end rather than through, otherwise we won't get through all of this information. We may not even have time for questions at the end, but if that's the case, I'm at the Chocolatey booth, I'll be around, just come and see me. There's also my details at the end, you can contact me and you can ask questions or whatever from that. So what this talk isn't, I'm not gonna sit here and just run commands. There are no demos here. If you want to see lots of demos, the door's over there, I'm sorry, it's, it's not what I'm doing today. I'm doing slides, um, I'm gonna talk. But these commands here, what they do is they search for Adobe Reader, they install Adobe Reader, they list the installed Adobe Reader, and they uninstall it. They both do the same thing. So there's no point me sitting here running these commands because they both do the same thing in their different ways. But effectively, for you as an end user, you get the same results. So this is pointless me doing this. So this isn't what I'm doing. What I am going to do is look a little bit at the history of package management on Windows. And um, we're going to look at supported and unsupported platforms for both tools. Uh, installation options, how do you actually install them? Uh, the important bit, integration of third party support, it's important you, whatever tool you use, uh, you don't have to spin up infrastructure, employ five people, and have all this maintenance and uh, you know cost involved in that. So it's important it works with your existing tools, your existing workflow, your existing infrastructure. So we'll look at that. We're gonna as well look at packages, manifest, submissions, and community. How do you create packages? Where do they go? What's the community aspect around both tools as well? We've got organizational options because they have very, very different needs to you and me. And whether you're a home user, a power user, a pro user, whatever you want to call yourself, they have different options. Um, you'll know working in organizations yourself, different needs, different. So we're going to look at the, the, the options available for both tools there. Uh, we're going to touch on privacy at the end, and then we're just going to summarize it, and off we go on our merry way. So Windows Package Manager history, a little bit of history as soon as I have a drink. So this was the landscape on Windows before Chocolatey CLI was born. I have to sort of say that one because Chocolatey CLI was around first. 
but it's also the landscape that you will see if you haven't got a package manager on something like Linux. So I think when we talk about package managers, my first thought is Linux. You've got apt, you've got yum, you've got Pac-Man, you've got yay, you've got DNF and 5,000 other ones. Um, so there's lots and lots there, but you couldn't imagine using Linux without a package manager. Might be possible, someone's gonna prove me wrong, but it's not gonna be a pleasant experience regardless. So before Chocolatey CLI come along, this really was the Windows landscape as well. You would get your software from somewhere. When I started in IT, there, the internet wasn't really a public thing. That's how long I've been in IT, 33 years, as I said. Um, you would download stuff from somewhere. Maybe it would be uh, over you know, one of the slow modems or you'd get it in a floppy disk or you'd buy it and they'd send it to you, whatever. You'd get the thing, you'd then put it into the machine, you'd then run the installer, you would then uh, click all the buttons, next, whatever it is, it would install, and then when you need to upgrade it, you can do the whole thing over again. Okay, it's got a little easier now in, te in terms of you can download from GitHub or the website or whatever, but the process is still the same once you've actually obtained it. Using a package manager, that is much, much easier because you can just install it with a package manager, upgrade it with a package manager, you know, uninstall it, whatever you wanna do, you can manage that there. So these things have got a lot easier uh, going forward. So this is a little timeline of package management on Windows. Um, March 2011, Chocolate CLI was released, version 060. That's not terribly important. And then September 2011, you had a Chocolate Community Repository where you got all the packages from, okay? So the first thing to note there is when I talk to people about Chocolate CLI or Chocolate products, they don't realize that Chocolate has been around for 13 years. It's not a flash in the pan. It didn't happen uh, last week. It's been around for 13 years, okay? Um, and then WinGet was released all the way here to the right in May 2020. And I'm not going to try and repeat that version number because it's too long. But uh, that's when they released the first version. That wasn't version one, as you can see. Um, but uh, Chocolate CLI has kind of been around four times as long as, uh, or three times as long, sorry, as WinGet has been there. Okay, so that's just a very, very brief overview. So supported and unsupported platforms, what does it run on basically? What's supported for it to run on and what will it run on? But, you know, it's not really supported. So here we're looking at, this is what Microsoft currently support for client and server-based operating systems. <clears throat> that is their life cycle at the moment, or that is within their life cycle at the moment. Now, Winget will only run on Windows 11 22H2, 23H2, and Windows 10 22H2. There is no 23H2 for Windows 10, which is why uh, that's not listed there. Um, Windows uh, Server 2022 has experimental support. We'll touch on that in the next slide, but that's all it will run on. So if you've got any of these other operating systems, Winget isn't an option for you at all. Stop here, leave. It's that bit, you know, you can't use it. Whereas Chocolate CLI will actually run on all of, and is supported in all of these operating systems. Okay, if you come to Chocolate A and say you've got a problem running Chocolate CLI on Windows Server 2012, that's supported. Okay, because again, it's, it's supported by Microsoft. We did support Windows Server 2008 R2 and Azure up until January, but that's now run end of life. So we try and keep up to date with what Microsoft support and kind of makes sense. But this is what it will also run on. Okay, so not technically all of them are supported, but some of them from the, you know, are in here from a previous slide, they're supported. But you've got other ones like, and I apologize for the colors here. The, yesterday I was given the slide template, which is all dark. My slides were originally lighter, so. I didn't have time to update all the logs. But Windows Server uh, 2003 R2 in the bottom right-hand corner on Windows 7 and the top left there, um, very old operating systems, but Chocolate CLI will actually run on those operating systems. We don't support it, but it will run on them. And you will have problems connecting to community repository due to TLS 1.2. Um, but if you can get .NET 4, .NET 4.5, or even .NET 4.8 onto those operating systems, then it will, it will run, okay? So you can still use that, all of those. We'd get, on the other hand, we'll only run on these three. Uh, Windows 10, 8, 1809 or later, that's the minimum version of Windows that uh, WinGet will support. And there's experimental support, as I said there, for Windows Server 2022 now. Um, that's unsupported. Um, when I originally did this talk, it didn't work. But apparently they've changed the wording in the README, so I kind of take from that. It kind of works. We're not supporting it, but, you know, um, in future versions, they probably will. So again, if you're running Windows Server operating systems, WinGet's possibly not an option for you, or even earlier client operating systems. <clears throat> so installation, how are we getting it onto the box? 
So there's, from Wingate's perspective, there's a number of different ways you can get it on there. Um, Microsoft Store App Installer um, app is what they recommend you use. Um, the reason for that is I think it's just the easiest way to get it installed. If you want to use the Microsoft Store, and I, know a lot, I know a lot of people don't want to do that. Um, but it is the only method that's listed here, apart from probably the patches and the out-of-box experience, that um, will self-update. So if you run it from, if you download it from GitHub and install it from the GitHub releases, it won't self-update. Um, you'll have to install and you upgrade um, the, the kind of manual way. Um, there's a Windows 10 patch and I've put in there an italic sort of. When I was testing it, um, I had three virtual machines, Windows 10 uh, Pro, Education and Enterprise. And, the only, and I fully patched the three of them. The only one that Winget was installed on at the end of that was the Pro version. So it could be that it's an Enterprise SKU or an, an educational SKU and it's not working on there, but the documentation suggests it should. So I don't know whether I would just had bad luck but that might um, be a problem as well if you're trying to you know, install it through patches. The Windows 11 out of box experience, again, is a sort of, um, if you install Windows 11 and uh, log in, you'll get a little box in the top right hand corner that says Windows is installing features. And it's at that point when get one installed, it takes around 15 minutes, depending on your machine, of course. <clears throat> Um, and then it'll be installed, but that could be a problem if you're using something like Packer or some sort of automation that require, you need a Windows 11 client for, because if you expect it to be there without logging in, it's not there, so you might need to install it. So again, that's a sort of way um, that it can be installed. There is also a chocolatey package, which I created and I maintain um, for Winget, so you can do choco install Winget and that should install as well. Um, on the chocolate CLI side, the traditional script, if you ever use chocolate CLI, you'll know you go to chocolatey.org slash install, there's a PowerShell command, you run, it downloads that script and executes it and it installs chocolate CLI. Now we always recommend that you read code from the internet, that you're downloading from the internet before you execute it, otherwise bad things probably will happen at some point. But that's been in place for, I think, about a decade, certainly as long as I've been at Chocolatey. Um, and it's been there longer than that, as I said. Um, yeah, pro probably a decade. So it's kind of tried and trusted, but that doesn't mean you have to try and trust it. So that's the traditional method that it's there. But we recognize that people don't always want to do that. There's an MSI that we created for version two of Chocolate CLI. So you can install that in a traditional way, double click it, go through next, 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 or you can install it with the traditional MSI command line options and you can install it automated and silently. Um, and then finally, there's also a Winget package for chocolate or a Winget manifest for chocolate. So it'd be Winget installed chocolatey.chocolatey, off it goes. Um, while we're not talking about chocolatey GUI, there's also a Winget chocolatey GUI package. We don't, chocolatey, we don't support, uh, maintain that. We don't support that. It's somebody else that, that created that, and, and that, which is fantastic. But that's not something we maintain. We just maintain the chocolatey one. So integrations and third party support. This is, as I said earlier on, this is quite important, particularly from an organizational point of view, where um, you've maybe got one of these configuration managers, and we'll talk about repository managers in the next slide, or you've maybe have other tooling. You need to make sure that the tools that you're going to use works with that existing tooling, that workflow. You don't need to stand up in any more infrastructure. You need to pay for that and maybe pay for people. You know that you know the situation. These things get complicated quickly. So if you've got a configuration manager, the best thing that can happen is that tool works great with it and you don't really have to do much more. So on the side of, uh, well, actually before I talk about that, these um, particular configuration managers are the ones that I know about. These are also the ones that people, when I talk to them, talk about. There will be other configuration managers, but I, in my opinion, they're not as popular. Um, there was a couple I'd looked at, was the CF Engine, which I hadn't actually heard of before this. Um, there's no support for either Chocolate CLI or Winget, so there's no point putting it on the slide. Um, SCCM doesn't really have native integration for either of them either. Um, you would run them as a normal command line tool. So again, that's not been put on there. And there's probably other ones, as I said, that, that you would think of. But these are the popular ones, in my opinion. Um, but there is native integration support for, sorry, for Puppet, any package, which is a package management or the package management provider replacement in PowerShell. Um, and you also get Intune there as well, which you would expect Winget would, would support, or and Microsoft Intune supports Winget in there, that would make sense. And there's a Puppet module as well, um, not maintained by Microsoft, it's maintained by a third party called Winget Pack or PKG, Winget PKG. And it was last updated in May. It may have been abandoned, or it may just be feature complete and there's no need for any more updates at the time, but that's still another option for you. But all of the other ones don't have any support for Winget. 
Um, there is uh, PowerShell DSC uh, issues being raised to get that working for Winget, but as far as I understand at the moment, there is nothing there for it. There might be some third parties that I might have missed, but I'm talking about from Microsoft themselves. Chocolate CLI works with all of these. Um, we have, starting at the top left-hand corner, we maintain the Ansible collection for uh, Chocolate CLI and chocolate products. You've got Chef underneath there. There's two cookbooks for that. There's an installation cookbook, which we maintain, and there's the management cookbook, managed packages cookbook that Chef maintains. Um, hopefully that will change in the future and they can maintain both, but at the moment that's the situation as it stands. Um, Chocolate CLI has, uh, has an integration for Microsoft Intune. You can use it with that. It's got a Puppet module that we used to maintain and then handed it over to Puppet, and I think they still maintain that. I don't think it's a community maintained module. SaltStack maintain their own chocolate CLI integration. Uh, any package, it's PowerShell, it works. Um, Octopus Deploy in the bottom right hand corner, hope you can see it above my head. Um, I took the existing templates for that um, and extended them with new functionality and then again passed them back to the community so they're still being maintained there. And Otter maintain their own, uh, bottom left hand corner, Otter maintain their own. I've left PowerShell DSC out um, just now. There is integration for that, but we're going to talk about that in a, in a couple of slides time. So repository managers, this is where you generally put your packages, okay? So repository managers, um, you would have things like uh, NPM in there, you'd NPM packages, you would have maybe Docker container images in there, Vagrant images, you'll have raw uh, repositories for various different types. You have Nougat repositories um, as well for those kind of packages. Hopefully some of that makes sense to you, but that's where you store your packages, okay? Uh, particularly if you're in an organization, you don't want to reach out to all these different places all the time. You want to make sure they're in your organization and you manage and maintain those packages, um, sorry, those repositories in there. So again, a bit like the configuration managers, these are the ones that I know about. These are the ones people talk to me about. So these are the kind of popular ones, I would argue. Again, there would be others and there are others, but as I said, these are the kind of popular ones. <clears throat> so we're going to move the GitLab uh, actually, I'll put it back just so you can see it. We're going to remove the GitLab package registry. Winget doesn't work with that, and Chocolate CLI won't work with it either. It's due to some sort of authentication that we can never get working. So I'm going to remove that one. But the other ones there, uh, Winget, that, or sorry, none of these have support for Winget repositories. Okay. The main reason for that, which we'll touch on in further slides, is uh, Winget uses its own, I would argue, custom repository type. It's a, a REST API source that none of these support. Okay, so it's not a, a, a one that's already existing. For example, Chocolate CLI uses a Nougat repository type, which is very popular, and has been about from, for eons. Um, so this is why all of these repository managers support Chocolate CLI, because they support Nougat repository types that, that we use. Um, so that makes sense uh, for that. Um, yeah. So that's, it, there is some, again, there's some issues or some tickets in various different places for people asking for support for Winget repositories, but at the moment, none of them have added it in. Um, the one that I've seen most traction for, I think, was ProGet, um, but it kind of stalled. They were interested in doing it, but there was, it wasn't as popular as they thought, um, and it's kind of stalled. So, but they'll probably pick it up later on, I would imagine. So we're here at a PowerShell conference, so I want to talk about the way you would manage uh, the, both tools with PowerShell. So um, for Winget, there's a PowerShell gallery module called Microsoft.Winget.Client, and there's also a chocolate CLI package for that, which again, I maintain, um, and that's Winget.PowerShell that you can install and manage uh, with that. There's also a package management or any package provider that we talked about a couple of slides ago. Uh, there's also a Crescendo wrapper, and a Crescendo is not something I've ever used. I know kind of what it does. I've not ha ever had a use case for it, so I've never really touched it. Um, but uh, Ethan Bergstrom has written co or, uh, created Cobalt, which is a Crescendo wrapper, and that was last updated last February. On the chocolate CLI part, um, for the PowerShell, you can actually parse the machine readable output. So chocolate uh, CLI, has a, an option, uh, dash dash limit dash output or dash r, if you want to do the short one. And it'll output it in a sort of delimited format that you can then convert from CSV and get create objects out of that, which you can use. Uh, there's also official community PowerShell modules. Um, I'll talk about that in, in the next line. There's also a CChoco and Chocolatey DSC resource. Um, so CChoco is maintained by Chocolatey, and there's also a Chocolatey DSC resource, which is also the Chocolatey module, which is the official community PowerShell module. 
Um, and that's maintained by Gail Colas. Um, some of you may have heard of Gail. He does quite a lot regarding DSC in particular in the community. <clears throat> so that's part of the chocolate community organization. There's also the package management, any package provider you can use, very much like OneGet. It's built on PowerShell. I had to put that in there because everything in a chocolate package is a PowerShell script. Um, if you want to do anything, um, all the instructions, we call it the installation instructions or the uninstallation instructions, um, are all PowerShell scripts. So that's easy enough for uh, you to maintain if you know PowerShell. So again, it's built on PowerShell. And Ethan Bergstrom also created Foil, which is another crescendo wrapper, but this time for Chocolatey CLI. And that was last updated in December last year. So supported sources, this is where I was going to talk a little bit about um, the Azure REST source. Um, I've, I've called it the Azure REST source there, but it's a REST API source that is the what Winget will query. And um, so if you're going to set up a package repository, that's what you need to set up. There's a repository called Wingets-CLI-REST source. I think it's something like that, um, where the, the code for that lives, but it's very much tied to Azure. It's using Azure databases. Um, there was talk of somebody converting it to AWS or changing it all over to AWS and getting that to work. And it had mixed results. Some people said it worked, some people didn't. So I really don't know what stage that's at, but the official supported way is in Azure. Um, so if you're in that ecosystem, great. If you're not, maybe that's a problematic. Uh, there's also the Microsoft Store source. Um, when you go use Winget, it'll ask you to set up terms and conditions so that you can actually query that source. Um, so, and again, just going back to what I said earlier, a lot of organizations don't want people using that. Maybe you don't want to use it, for example. So that might be problematic. There's also a static web source. Um, I, I've found um, a couple of GitHub repositories that actually acted as sources for packages. I can never understand how it worked, I'll be honest. Uh, that probably needs, uh, says more about me than their code. But um, there's something I wanted to dig into, but it's an option where you could, you know, organizations could potentially have their own repository sitting in GitHub. And then you could connect to it from Winget. The one that I, the, the main one that I found that was seemed to be healthy was an organisation I can't remember their name, who had actually created their own GitHub repository uh, and got this to work. So it's as I said, something I wanted to dig into. Um, Winget supports file shares and local folders in italics there again because it doesn't support UNC paths. So if you want to use a file share, you would probably have mapped some sort of drive to it and get it to work that way. Um, it also supports local folders, but it'll only support local folders, sorry, it'll only support manifest, not manifests, in a local folder. So if you wanted to do Adobe Acrobat, you've downloaded the manifest, you have to point it to the manifest, not a folder containing manifest and say, go and pull Adobe Acrobat out of that. I don't know why that's the case, but that that is uh, certainly the way it was. Chocolate CLI, on the other hand, I mentioned Nougat V2 and V3 feeds. Um, we recently added uh, V3 support, Nougat V3 support into Chocolate CLI in version two. That was last May that was released. Um, so, and because those repository formats are very, very popular, that's why you've got so many repository managers that simply support them. You can also use a static Nougat V3 source, a bit like the static web source that I mentioned with Winget. It's not something I've dug into, but it was really interesting to find out about it. When we were releasing our doing beta versions of Chocolatey CLI version two, uh, people were saying, you know, you get feedback, things are not working. And somebody was saying that it wasn't working with their static Nougat V3 source. None of us, as far as I'm aware, none of us actually knew these things existed. So this is a new thing. Um, and that's really interesting because if you can do it from just a, a website, a basic website, a static website, that cuts out a lot of uh, the, the infrastructure that you would need otherwise. So that's interesting. I don't know how that scales, but that's something I want to look at. Uh, also, Chocolate CLI does file share in local folder. Um, so you can put packages in folders, whether it's in a file share or in a local folder on your machine, and actually query that as you would do any other source. It's not recommended for anything maybe above a, like a POC or, or a few packages um, because it, it does slow down because it's got to get through all those packages. You also don't get the sort of information, the, the feature, featureness that you would get from a repository manager because you are just dealing with files on a, a folder. Uh, but it's handy for things like um, if you have got demos for um, you know, doing a talk, put all the packages in a folder, spin up your Vagrant machine, have it pull all those packages and install from that local folder. That works great. So packages and manifests, and I'm bang on time. No, I'm not. I'm actually behind. Um, so I'll probably need to speak a bit faster. Um, packages and manifests. So in order to create a package for, for Winget, you use a tool called Winget Create, or you can use the PowerShell script, YAML Create. Um, and that will go and interrogate the whatever installer you give it. I've put MSI in this case, but it could be an MSI X and it supports other uh, installer types as well. 
Um, and once it has that information, it starts asking you some questions and it pre-fills the answers. It's really, really good. It's really simple. It's really easy. It's, it's great. Um, I was really, really impressed. Um, it's not, you'd look at it and go, well, that's not hugely powerful, but the power is in the fact it's, simplic it, it's simplicity. Um, so I really, really liked that. But the problem with uh, YAML manifest is that there's no flexibility involved. It just runs things. You've got the installer, you've got the command line switches, and off you go. There's no other things that you can do. Um, now, I'm not saying that they won't build that in, but that's the, the case at the moment. <clears throat> it only runs the installers or adds the supported formats that, that they support. So again, there's no real flexibility around there, but you can submit straight from the tool. After you get those questions, you can just submit it away and off it goes into what we'll look at, which is the WinGet community repository. Chocolatey CLI has something similar, uh, where we use a chocolate new command to create uh, a new package. You can give it options on the command line and it will fill in that information um, into the metadata. Um, you can also use templates to accelerate and simplify that creation process. So you could have a, a template for MSIs, a template for zips, a template for executables, whatever it is you're deploying and it'll pre-fill a lot of that information in and make packaging the second time a lot easier. Um, again, it finds defaults for most of the installers like Winget, um, you, you know, MSI and et cetera, but Chocolatey CLI supports 22 different installer formats, um, some of them more obscure than others. Um, it, because it's built on NuGet technology, which is originally created by Microsoft, and we've extended that format, it continues to use XML because that's what the NuGet metadata file is, it's XML. Um, you use the Chocolate pack command to pack your package up into, you know, a file, and then you push it to um, the community repository as we're going to talk about in this case. And it uses PowerShell inside the package for that flexibility. So for example, if you had some software that has a trial, if you don't give it a license or a, does a license version, if you do give it a license, you could have package parameters there that says, you know, here's the license file that will go install the license version. But if you don't give it that, it'll install the trial version. So you don't need two packages there. You can use package parameters to give you some of that flexibility, which is really good. And then the Chocolate for Business edition, there's a package builder and package pusher UI, so you don't even need to edit text files, you can just do it all from uh, a GUI. So the Winget Community Repository, um, th this is a bit that I got a little bit disappointed. So when you create the manifest, it was great, it was really simple, it was great, and uh, then you actually go and submit it. And while there's a lot of information coming back, because it goes through GitHub pull requests, so you get like flat, um, up flags, labels, um, and there's information being put in there as part of the automation running. The actual steps of what it does are really unclear and the documentation's unclear. It could be deliberately unclear so that they're not uh, telling you everything that's going on and therefore you could exploit that. That's potentially the reason. But the steps are unclear for the validation, installation and scanning. That's, you know, it, I, I didn't really know what, what went on. The antivirus it uses is Defender and other scanners didn't really give you any more information than that. But then it talks about later on, if you have a false positive, submit it to Defender. So what were the other scanners? So I, I got confused there. Um, the installers that are not silent can't be added. Um, I've talked about the false positive ones. The AV scans will not be accepted. I assume that once they're accepted as false uh, positives by the AV engine, then you'll be able to push it again. The interactions via pull re request comments, um, we're all kind of used to that, I would imagine, in here. So it's fairly familiar, so that's a good idea. Um, there's 19 members of the moderation team, and that includes 10 Winget and nine community moderators. And there's 5,000, this is my number, and I'll explain it in a second. There's 5,332 packages in the repository and 38,916 versions of those packages. Now, that's a repository count. So I've went in and cloned the Winget packages repository and counted them, not manually, but using some wonderful PowerShell, of course. Um, and counting, and that's the number I got. But if you go and query the packages from Winget itself, it tells you there's 5,997. This was yesterday. But if you go to a, a website called winget.run, which is a kind of front end for all of this, um, it, again, it's a third party, it's not supported by Microsoft. There's 4,315 packages. So my number's in the middle. I actually don't know the true number of packages. And um, neither of them also give you the, the number of versions of those packages. Okay, so I had to count that. So take my number with a, a you know, grain of salt, um, but it's kind of in the middle of the other two. So we're going to say it's roughly right. Let's say five to 6,000 packages, and we're probably not far off. Uh, Chocolatey CLI, um, not silent installers can be scripted and they are accepted. The, because it's in the community, um, a lot of the community members use something called auto hotkey. So if you've got a particularly bad installer, and I could go off on a rant, but I'll try and keep it brief. Um, developers these days seem to get more and more 
um, ambitious with making things as complicated as possible to install rather than embracing the command line and making things you know installable through automation or from the command line itself they seem to be brushing against that and there's some resistance there so they develop the most weird and wonderful installers imaginable that you can uh, the, trying to automate is now on impossible I have no idea why they do it the GUI the, the aspect of the GUI is gone those days are long gone we're now on the command line. These developers are just not accepting that. So this is why you need to automate some of this with like pushing buttons effectively. Um, so uh, a lot of packages in the community repository use something called auto hotkey. And what that does is it'll mimic mouse presses. So they'll, you know, the box comes up and you'll be able to click things because it can't be automated in any other way. There's also something called auto IT. I've seen a few packages used. It's the same sort of thing. Um, but we accept them. Um, and because of the power of the chocolatey package, you know, you've got the PowerShell script inside. You can actually do that. You can't do that with the YAML manifest. It doesn't allow you, there's no flexibility there. Um, so that's maybe a strength or a weakness. Depends which way the side of the fence you want to sit on. Anyway, um, I'm burning time here ranting about developers. Um, so, it, but we work with maintainers and AV false, po false positives. So, you know, it's, it's inevitable that um, when packages come in, we submit it to Virus Total, which scans it against 60 to 70 AV engines. Um, and it's inevitable there'll be a number of those engines that will flag up some binary at some point with something. So we try and work with the maintainers on that. Some of them will be false positives, we know this. Some of them will be problematic and we just say we, we can't simply uh, host them because even though it might be perfectly fine, we've not got any evidence that it's perfectly fine. The thing we use as the baseline is saying it's potentially not. So, uh, so yeah, um, so that's what we try and work with people to get those packages through. The interaction is via moderation comments, which is basically a text box on a website. It's not difficult. Um, a bit like a pull request comment, um, very much similar. Uh, and there's, there's 12 chocolatey team and community moderators, so there's six of each. <clears throat> and some of the chocolatey team here today are moderators, including myself. Uh, so the numbers at the bottom of the screen there are in comparison to the Winget ones. These ones are taken from the community.chocolatey.org website. They were taken yesterday, so obviously they'll have changed today. But there's 10,334 packages or 215,000 versions of those packages. It's a product that's been around for 13 years, so you're going to expect more than what Winget's got. So that's why those numbers will be higher. But there's 2.9 billion downloads, and we're waiting for that tick over to 3 billion. Um, it'll be happening soon. So... Uh, yeah, so that's that's since day dot 2.9 billion downloads. That's got to say something um, about the, the community repository. Unfortunately, I don't have any statistics for the Winget one. It's not that I'm admitting them. Uh, there is just none. Um, maybe Winget or Microsoft don't count them. I don't know. So organizational options. <clears throat> uh, yeah, the Boring Company, that's apparently actually a real, and it's not the one you're thinking of. Um, but anyway, uh, deployment. So... Um, from for for Winget deployment may be easy. We've talked about the different options. It just depends which side of the fence you sit on. Whether you think the out of box experience or the Windows Ten patches are problematic or not. So maybe it's easy for you and you don't have to worry about that. Uh, Winget is an MIT licensed product, so uh, organizations love open source or really open licenses because they can do with it as they please and they don't need to get legal involved. Um, that's all, but the problem with Winget for me for organizations is it's tied to Microsoft and Azure pretty much. I see it as a vehicle for people to go into Azure. You've got like the uh, Azure REST source, for example, is tied very much to Azure. Um, that might not be a problem. If you're knee deep in the, the Azure ecosystem, th that's not an issue for you at all. Um, but if you're not, then it could be an issue. Um, you, you know, again, it depends what side of the fence you sit on. There's no or limited internal support for manifest and binary location. I would say there's none, but I'll put limited because I could have missed something. But um, that's a problem. <clears throat> there's limited repository manager options, as we talked about. There are actually two, are two hosted repository options that I forgot to mention. Um, Third-party options. One is called winget.pro, and the other one is called wingetty, I think. Um, and they will they, all they do is host uh, winget repositories. That's all they do. They don't host any others. Um, and they're currently $50 a month if you want to pay for that. I think one of them allows you to run it open source in your own infrastructure. Uh, perhaps the other one does as well. I forgot to mention that, so that was my bad. Um, but that's all they do is just win get repositories. So obviously they don't support chocolate uh, repositories or any other product repositories. Um, there's no source, source authentication. I found a GitHub issue talking about it, asking for it is still open. 
I can't find anything else. So I don't know whether they have broken something and it's not working for them or whether there's genuinely no source of authentication. I, I, from what I've read, it sounds like there isn't. But again, that's in italics because uh, I could be wrong there. And it's free. There's no business support. If you go to Microsoft for support with Winget or any packages, you'll not get any. Uh, you, you know, you're on your own. It's a community product. It's open source product. It's a community repository. It's down to you to fix. Chocolate CLI, on the other hand, deployment is easy. Well, you know, it's the same as Winget. Um, different options, but the same. It's, it's easy. Um, open source license. It's Apache for uh, Chocolate CLI. It's flexible and decentralized in the sense it's not tied to Microsoft, Azure, AWS, or anything else. It works with everything. We say it integrates with everything, but it's working with the, the tools that we talked about today, the configuration managers and the repository managers. Um, there's internal package support, so you can actually take a Google Chrome or Adobe Acrobat. That was the one we were talking about earlier. You can actually take all of the resources for Adobe Acrobat that it would normally reach out to for Adobe and download them. You put them all inside the package, take that package to an AirGap network and install it without any problems. And you can do that with the upgrades as well um, because it doesn't have to reach out to the internet. Everything that needs is inside the package. Uh, it's got Nougat V2 and V3 repository managers uh, support as we talked about, I won't go over that again. But there's free and business options. If you're running the open source version of Chocolate CLI, you can use it in your organization. You can use it in your uh, university or your school or whatever. There's no issues with doing that, but there's only free support for that. We call it community assistance. We usually do it through Discord. Um, but there's various other avenues, GitHub issues, things like that, that we'll take it from. But there's also uh, business options. If you're a chocolate for business customer, you will uh, get access to our support team and they will do everything from setting it up to be able to troubleshoot issues with you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the last number I heard for um, first ticket response was nine minutes, which is pretty good. Um, so you won't get that from many other organizations. So. Privacy, this is the one I need to stop talking so much about because this really bothers me. Telemetry, <clears throat> this is a problem. And this is my opinion, I'm speaking again, apologies. I'm speaking again as an MVP. Um, there seems to be a trend in the IT world to just collect data and that's it. You know, you guys are, you just, you're using the product, I want to collect your data. I would suggest if you're collecting data without um, people opting into it, um, you're collecting it without consent. And I entirely disagree with collecting data without consent. Um, you should let, let people opt in. I agree that probably most of us won't opt in, but there's a number of open source projects uh, or tools that I use that I actually opt into data collection for because I think they're asking. They you know, want my consent. I'm happy to give that consent because I'm using that tool. But when you, if they did it the other way around, I would go, no, I'm not, I'm not giving you the data. It's just, it's a whole, it's respect. You're not respecting me as a user. And I get I'm using the tool for free, but still, you know, there's there's a line there. Anyway, there we go. That's me rant a little bit. But anyway, one get collects data by default. Okay, um, there is an opt out, and you can it apparently also honors Windows privacy settings. Um, I believe with Windows 10, I think you could you could only turn it down to basic. You couldn't turn it off. That could have changed. I don't use Windows 10. Um, but if that's the case, it will probably still report data back. You'll need to dig into that yourself and make sure that's correct. There is a dependent package um, for one get called Microsoft dot ui.xaml, and that will collect data with no opt-out. That Again, that could have changed. That was version 273, I think. I maintain the package for that, the chocolate package for that, which is why I know about it. Um, that's a problem for me as well. So even if you're installing one, get it installs that as a dependency, and it's still collecting data. Chocolate CLI has no telemetry, so there's not much more to talk about there. It doesn't phone home. It doesn't send license counts. It doesn't um, send uh, any information back at all. It doesn't send your location. Now that you could look at that as um, problematic in the sense that we don't have any data on what our customers are using, but we see that differently. We see that as respecting the customer, that is their data. And we can always ask customers how they're using their product and get that information if they want to provide it. So we've, we've still closed that loop. We still get that information, but we're not uh, getting data without consent. <clears throat> There's a couple of screenshots here that I'm going to quickly go through. I'm not going to read them. Um, but the very first top bit there talks about the Winget client is instrumented, I don't like that word, but that's just me, to collect usage and, usage and diagnostic data. Um, but if you compile your own version of Winget, uh, because it is an open source tool, then that instrumentation or that data collection is not enabled, which is great. But it also talks a little bit there, and this is just from the readme in the Winget uh, CLI uh, GitHub repository, so you can go and read it. But it does tell you there how to disable it, and it respects machine-wide privacy settings, etc. This is a screenshot that is basically in human language about 
you know, what data is collected. There's the GitHub issue if you want to go and read it. Um, but it, it basically just repeats what we've kind of said. It'll collect some information, it puts it into the um, local event logs, and then that's kind of sent off to Microsoft. And finally, this is one I normally read a little bit about. This is actually written by Rob Reynolds, the founder of and CEO of Chocolate 8 Software. And um, before Winget was really putting telemetry into its product, he wrote, a, there was a, a, an issue raised about telemetry in general. And he uh, created this comment on there about this. Um, again, I'm not going to read a lot of it, but he's basically saying he feels very strongly about no one has a right to your data. And it's not just a respect thing, it goes deeper than that. And there's a lot of information in there as well about chocolatey CLI um, or chocolatey products. Um, they never, uh, what I'm saying, if they never touch the community repository. So if you don't download anything from community repository using your own internal repository, there is zero collection of tele telemetry, um, no call home. It's not a right to collect it and have the data to understand how you use the tool. To make it better is not a good enough reason. But if you do use a community repository, we do collect the IP address and some request information. And that is done for the statistics that I showed you earlier on, number of people downloading packages. And also to pre prevent abuses, we have rate limiting, et cetera, on the repository to make sure it's always available. And it's not just for the, uh, for the few, but for the many. So we have to make sure that people are not abusing it. Issue numbers there if you want to go and read more of it. So the summary, I've got three minutes left so I can slow down now. Uh, easy installation for Winget. Um, it's early, it's only four years old, but you know, it's come a long way. Um, you've got a Microsoft team working on it, a large Microsoft team. Um, well, I think it's a large Microsoft team. Um, it's simple. Um, as I mentioned about the question-based you know, approach, it's quite simple, I, I really like that. It's got a large repository, I skipped over that one. Um, nice terminal integration, I like the way it works. It looks good. Um, I think it's kind of bound to uh, Windows Terminal, I'm not sure. I haven't used it in anything outside of that. Um, the manifest is, is quite limiting, we've talked about that. Um, it's very Microsoft Azure centric. Um, again, if you're knee deep in Microsoft and Azure stuff, it's probably not a problem for you, but it's a good point out. The docs need work, as I mentioned earlier on, maybe some of the information has been excluded deliberately. Otherwise, the information's not there, but I would suggest they need to work. Um, Chocolate CLI, again, easy installation. It's been around 13 years now. It's got the largest Windows repository available, um, 10 and about 1,000 packages. It's powerful. It can be complex, and it can be complicated if you go off on a tangent. That's part of the whole metadata in the PowerShell. It's, it's a blessing and a cost for us. PowerShell is incredibly powerful, but you can get yourself into trouble. Um, it's flexible and decentralized. It works with all the things. And the docs need to work. We say chocolate either if you're looking for something, it'll be in the docs, but finding it might be the problem. So what to choose? You're probably going to expect me to say chocolate CLI, and I'm not. Um, you choose whatever tool works for you. That's a bit of a cop-out. But what it is, is if you're knee-deep in the, the Microsoft and the Azure ecosystem, um, and you don't need internalized packages, um, and you potentially don't want to stand up some more infrastructure, then maybe um, Winget is the thing for you. Maybe if it's got the right packages in there, that'll work fine for you. If, on the other hand, you're not tied to, or you don't want to be tied to Microsoft and Azure, um, you want internalized packages, you've got an air gap network, you want the power and flexibility of the PowerShell scripts within your package, then Chocolate CLI would be the thing for you, as opposed to Winget, which doesn't give you that flexibility. Um, so it really just com comes down to your use case and you know what you want to use it for. Hopefully, I've shown in these slides um, information that helps you make that decision. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, and we don't have time for questions, um, if you want to ask any questions, these are my details. Um, if you want to take a picture or not, it's up to you, but that's where you'll find me. You'll also find me outside at the Chocolatey booth, um, probably in the hallways, etc. as well. I've got another talk on Thursday, so I'll be about, obviously, for that as well. Um, and then we've got one final slide, which is to say thank you, and please, please give feedback. It's really important for me to know if I've spoke far too quickly. Um, if I've been biased, or if you enjoyed the talk or not, um, please give feedback on it. And that's it. Thank you very much.